I'm Andrew. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in philosophy, uh, presented at a few conferences, done a little bit of research, read a, a few dumb books. Uh, this is Terrence. I'm Terrence. I read a book. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Neither do I. This book, to be exactly. Has anyone else read Being a Nothingness? Oh, it's man. a real page turner, right? It's great. <laughs> All right. So, welcome to Sartre Skeletons and Sans Undertale. We're going to take you on a journey. But first, let's explain our methodology as all good panels begin with. So first, we're gonna have to talk about Sartre's modes of being. They're a little confusing because they sound similar, but they're very different and you better not mix them up. It's bad. Uh, second, we're gonna need to talk about the skeleton inside all of us, but we'll get to that. Thirdly, after we understand the skeleton inside of us, we're gonna need to understand the skeleton inside the others, of course. Uh, and fourth, what is character? You probably think you know, you don't. It's weird. Fifth, how do video games play with the idea of character? And then secondly, where does that lead us into bad faith? And then finally, I think this panel goes somewhere, but I'm not sure. I think uh, our friend added another slide at the end when we weren't looking. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> ah, there he is, the man himself. Uh, so this is Jean-Paul, I think Sartre. Sartre, uh, I've had professors who don't tell me which one's the right way to say it, so I'm just gonna say Sartre. Uh, this guy is considered the father of existentialism, basically inventing the term. Uh, he's a cool guy in like a thing called phenomenology a little bit. Don't worry about that term, it's weird. Uh, but I think what we would like to start with is a little bit on like what existentialism is in like philosophy, because I think when people hear that term, they often have this misconstrued idea that it's just people going, oh, there's no purpose, there's no point, what's the meaning? And it kind of isn't, it's actually very life affirming and cool, because uh, they're more concerned with the idea of freedom and the fact that you can kind of do whatever you want. They take that idea of, oh, there's not a real purpose, and instead of going into despair, like maybe Kierkegaard might, uh, this dude's just like, no, take control, do what you want, you can do it only you are holding yourself back. And that's kind of cool and uplifting. Uh, he also wrote literature and plays, which after reading this is much lighter and kind of explains his ideas better. But if you haven't read this, you don't catch them. It's a little catch 22. Uh, so now that we understand the man, the myth, and the legend, let's talk a little bit about modes of being. So the first type of mode of being is the being in itself. Now, in itself has a thing called facticity. This is an important term because what that means is that this is an object that has a distinct history, purpose, and meaning. So the example Sartre gives is an inkwell. An inkwell sits on your desk and it holds ink. That's how it exists. No matter what it does when it's empty of ink, if I take it, throw it on the ground and break it, all those shards of glass are still the inkwell and it still exists to hold ink. That's it, it's got purpose, it's doing its thing. It can't really do anything else. Hooray, right? And then you have this unfortunate other build of being that we all experience also, called being for itself. Because human experience involves both of these. So the being for itself means that you're always changing. You're always moving forward towards different, as he puts, potentialities. So what this means is that you can never stop and exist in itself, because you're always moving, you're always changing. There's no such thing as a distinct purpose that lasts forever. And you looking for that is what causes all of your problems, so stop it. <laughs> Would you like to add anything? Do you have a microphone? I do have a microphone, I'm looking at our slime. Oh yeah, the notes aren't showing up, so good luck. Ah, God damn it. <laughs> All right. I hope you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? That's what this is now. I think we're good. Yeah, no, we got rid of yeah. everything. Yeah, our pace. Pace good. All right. Now, my favorite slide. The bone body. This it wouldn't be a philosophical panel if we didn't come up with weird terminology and then spend too long defining it. Most of this book is just him saying a word, and then the rest of the chapter is, what do I mean by this word? 
Like, we'll see with character, you thought you knew. Everyone thinks they know what character means. You don't. You don't. There's like a hundred pages. I think I get it. So, what is the, the bone, bone body? <laughs> so, inside all of us, of course, is a skeleton. Now, despite it being inside all of you, hopefully, uh, the skeleton exists in itself in a weird, strange twist of fate. Your skeleton does not want anything. Your skeleton exists with purpose and function and is also moving all of the time with you. Yet, if we look at the example Sartre gives us of going to the doctors, we understand that this is a little weirder than we thought because when you go to the doctors, you broke your arm maybe, right? You gotta get an x-ray. So you go to the doctor, he x-rays you up, and then you look at the picture that he gives you and you're like, mm, yep, that's a broken arm. But you don't go, that's me. You see that picture and you're like, that's like something else. That's like a weird object that kind of exists and I guess like has a name tag that says it's me. In fact, they could have shown you someone else's arm and you probably would have been like, yeah, you know what, that's my broken arm, yeah. Your skeleton is inside of you, but he's not you. He's just with you, <laughs> always. What does he want? <laughs> Does he? <laughs> now that we're a little weirded out because other things are contemplating us, let's understand the body for others. This is serious. Why are you laughing? <laughs> so Sartre has this very famous phrase. This has led to a lot of like contemporary philosophies, a lot of like cool shit, honestly, because uh, he talks about the gaze of the other. Because our whole lives, we usually just kind of see life as we're kind of looking through a window. Everything's safe, everything's fine. You guys can't hurt me, I'm up here. I'm good, right? But then all of a sudden you have one of those moments where you feel it. Like I made eye contact with that guy right there. And suddenly it's like, wait, no. I'm being judged right now. <laughs> I should probably act more professional. That's the body for others. Because you realize that x-ray in the doctor's office Despite the fact that you know that that's not yourself and whatever that is does not reflect you as a human being, that's what everyone else sees you as. Your sense organs, which are also not you because it's your senses that you use, that's what everybody thinks is you. So whatever your eyes look like, not what your eyes are seeing, that's what everybody thinks is you and you and whoever is in the back that I think I'm pointing to. Yeah, hi. <laughs> We're no longer comfortable with the gaze of the other. <laughs> huh. <Yeah>. Whoa. <laughs> so, character. I might get a little wordy with this. Please stick with me. I've tried to improve on the Donkey Kong panel, so I've taken out a lot of these weird quotes and digressions. Um, so, when Sartre uses character, he talks about sort of like, Oh, we gotta use the phrase temporality, don't we? You are not going to use the phrase temporality. I'm using temporality. I do not want to talk about I got about a text from this guy who's just like, why am I reading temporality? And I was like, because he's making you. Do not read temporality. I didn't read temporality in school. <laughs> but I read it for you, all right? <laughs> so we're gonna talk about it. So character involves your conscious decisions at any moment. Your decisions as a conscious being make your character, but stop. You never experience someone else's character in the present, and obviously not in the past. You can only experience character by foreseeing the future. So Sartre gives the example of a man taking a nice little stroll, right? This guy's having a great time. But we don't ever see him walking in the present. All we see are little cues and things that he's doing. He's moving his legs in a certain way. He's got a little stride to his arms. And in our head, we go, oh, He's going to be moving in the future. That means that he is walking. But at any time, this can change. He could just stop, right? I can't predict that. Only he can. So character only exists in the future based on your decisions as a conscious being. You make those choices. You do. 
It's also important to draw a distinction between the physical reality of a person walking, actually observing them performing that action, and your understanding of the purpose of walking. Like if you see someone who's doing a solid power walk towards a bathroom, you understand that they need to go to the bathroom. And the purpose for their hurry is to get there faster. But while you, that perception is not the same as simply perceiving someone walking, the physical act of walking. Uh, and this distinction will become important right oh. now. <laughs> video games. We all like video games, right? Yeah. Yeah. I hope you do, you're here. If you don't it's like- It's half the title. <laughs> Are you here for Vorfest? I hope not. This was on the soundboard. Very cool. <laughs> All right, so one cool thing about Sartre, which helps us a ton, is he loved reading and talking about interacting with characters in novels, which is probably why he wrote his own. So when we learn about something like character, the first thing we usually think about is characters in a book. That's not the same. In fact, I think, what did we do? We spent like 20 minutes in silence because we looked at a quote for character, and I was like, wait, no, this doesn't mean what we think it means. Flip, flip, flip. Yeah, no, it was great. So characters in games exist in a weird state as only for others. They have no conscious choice. They don't actually do anything. We read the book and we get invested with the character. He uses Marcel Proust, which is like a really fancy French novel in seven volumes. Pretty cool. Actually a page turner. But the idea is that you see Marcel in the book, but he's not real. He's not making decisions. He's just going along. It's a, as he puts it, a document. Oh, do you have the quote? I got Thank the quote you. Right. Oh man, we can read one quote, I think. So long as the reader, using the usual optic process of reading, identifies himself with the hero of the novel, the character of Marcel escapes him. Better yet, it does not exist on this level. It appears only if I break the complicity which unites me to the writer. Only if I consider the book no longer as a confidant, but as a confidence. Still better, as a document. This character exists, therefore, only on the plane of the for others. And that is why the reason, oh gosh, that is the reason why the teachings and the descriptions of the psychological realists are never rediscovered in the lived experience of the subject. So that was a mouthful. That is a mouthful. But that ties back into what we were talking about earlier, where others observe you. A video game doesn't observe you, usually. Hopefully. <laughs> it doesn't. So you never have that alienating experience of someone else looking at you and seeing something different from what you perceive yourself as. But you still have to perceive yourself as that because you know that they are a person looking at you. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting because I feel like video games are starting kind of to breach this. Uh, there's some novels that get a little postmodern and weird, but I think video games do it the best. Uh, has anyone ever played the horror game I'm Scared? Uh, you go through that game, uh, and when you beat it at one point, it closes itself and starts installing files on your computer. Like your computer will call it a virus because suddenly there's folders with text documents that are saying, now your data is not safe. When you're going just on the internet and browsing, the game still is going on. It's not done yet. It's kind of horrifying. And so like, if you don't like that, don't install that on your computer. It doesn't go away. Uh, a less extreme example uh, is, I think it's called Eternal Darkness. Probably. It's There's that GameCube game that you can't find anywhere. Yeah, there we go, this guy knows. Uh, that game has a bunch of sanity effects. Apparently in QA, there was one where it would just delete your save file if you hadn't played it for at least three hours and you'd have to restart. Uh, my favorite one is the one where there's like a fake gnat on your screen that flies around and tries to get you, the player, to like think, oh gosh, there's like a fly stuck to my screen only to slap your CRT and break it. Oh, not that I'd do that. I read Sartre, I'm smart enough to not do that. I know what's real and what's a character or not. I think. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, so, how are we acting then with games and novels, you know? There's something going on there. Some, there's some, yeah. some, some uh... <laughs> Would you say we're acting in bad faith? It could very well be. 
What does bad faith mean? So, uh, bad faith is, as a person who has freedom, you want to have direction and purpose, you know. Those you want the being in itself. You want to be, similar to how this notepad exists. It's a notepad, you'd write things on it. Give me purpose. Video games are very good at this. Uh, you can find purpose either through getting a higher score, unlocking more content, uh, doing it faster, you see a lot of speed running. Being a completionist, I might say. A completionist. Uh, but all this is to say is that Sartre uses the concept of bad faith as a way we get stuck. Because we have our transcendence, our being for itself. But then we get stuck looking for in itself. So we could use, um, oh, there was like a film we watched in a class. I wish I remembered what the name of it was. It's basically about this guy who's a butler. And he is like the best butler. Like he is like 80 and he is crushing it. And then he wakes up one day and he's too old because he's 80 and he cannot actually physically be a butler anymore. And so for a little bit of the movie, he's like, no, I can still do it. I'm going to do my best. And then everyone's like, you either need to retire or you're fired. So he's like, okay, well, can't be a perfect butler if I'm fired. So he quits. And then suddenly he's like, wait, who am I? Because his whole life, he's been the perfect butler. That was his being in itself. He saw the object of the perfect butler and put on a sort of play where he imagined what the character was and said, I'm going to do all of those things. Another example Sartre uses is like a bad date. So you have like a waiter and they're just like tippy toeing everywhere. They're zooming around, like dodging with platters in their hand. It's like almost like too perfect, you know? Because that waiter is also acting in bad faith because they're acting as the perfect waiter. That's not themselves. They can walk around like their normal self, but they refuse to because they want to be the best waiter. And at the same time, they're waiting on people who are on a date and they both hate it, but they don't want to be mean to the other person. So, you know, the dude's being like a little creepy, right? And like, it's kind of gross. And the woman he's dating is like not into it, but she doesn't want to like spoil the mood. So she's just trying to like ignore him and like maybe like text on her phone. They're both free to just leave. Sartre says that's probably the better option is to just leave. But we get stuck in bad faith where we want to be the perfect date. We want them to have the perfect time and not look back and be like, oh, that was miserable, even though you probably will. That sounds miserable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know who else would take you on a date in a video game. <laughs> Oh shit, we need the quote. Yeah, now we're talking about temporality. Oh, uh, temporality. Oh yeah, so Sartre loves the past. So we all have pasts. It's part of our facticity, right? We can never escape this. Despite the fact that we are free, we can keep moving, all our potentialities change and move and groove. Our past always is there. We can only ever act in negation to our past. Uh, as this long quote goes, do you have the other quote too? I loved that other quote. Which one? It really one? instilled like that existential dread in me. This one? I think so. Oh no, we missed our chance. We, oh that well. One, that one is too late. It even seems at first glance that freedom cannot modify its past in any way. The past is that which is out of reach and which haunts us at a distance without our even being able to turn back to face it in order to consider it. If the past does not determine our actions, at least it is such that we cannot take a new decision except in terms of it. So what's that mean? What'd he say? <laughs> I was just looking through our other quotes when you were reading that. Thanks. <laughs> our past is always there. Even when we're acting and we think, hey, I could just reset things or use a different save file. It's always there. We've always made that decision. It can never be undone. We think it's gone. But then sometimes games sort of change the rules a little bit. Say it! <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to. <laughs> so, it is no coincidence that as we enter the Sands fight, the first thing he does is he opens his eyes to gaze at us, to judge us. 
suddenly the video game is no longer playing by the rules. Instead, it's been watching us the whole time. Thank you. <laughs> he mentions all the times we've reset, gone back, and been like, hey, you know, no one will remember this. It's a dumb video game. What does it know, you know? They're characters, right? But then all of a sudden we have sands. And all of a sudden, our sins come back. Even when we beat him, if we try to do the true pacifist run again, it's changed forever. Oh no, what's the quote? This is it a good time for this one? What is it, what is it? Let me read it. Okay, I'll read it. If this doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. It's true. Blame him. <laughs> My body is there, not only as the point of view which I am, but again, as a point of view on which are actually brought to bear points of view which I could never take. My body escapes me on all sides. That's pretty good, actually. That kind of envelops. Oh, wait, isn't there like another part on the other page? Ooh, yeah. Thus, at the very moment when I live my senses as this inner point of view on which I can take no point of view, their being for others haunts me. They are. It's in italics. So suddenly, we're playing a game and the game is giving us the gaze of the other. Sans Undertale, a bone body, which we assume to be in itself with no real cause, has suddenly found purpose and has been doing it the entire time. That's pretty wacky. Sans no longer exists solely as a character for others, but now we perceive him as being a character for himself. Creepy. <laughs> On that note, oh no. <laughs> Thanks for sitting through that, guys. <laughs> it's Q&A time. How many of these are there? I don't know. Anyone who asks a question gets one of these now. It's true. <laughs> Does anyone have? Oh gosh, there are questions. Got questions. All right, uh, the guy halfway in the back. Do you think that part of the point for Sands doing this was to actually go and tie into the idea that the timeline in Undertale was circular, or do you think they just kind of want to just add something so that way you could just run through the whole game and be like, okay, well we're done. Let me write a very bad and you call it on now. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's a real zinger. First of all. Um, I think it's a little bit of like pointing out, and I think Flowey also talks about it, is a little bit of like the bad faith argument where they kind of just go, hey, are you just doing this because you're looking for content? Like I think a lot of people enjoyed the game because it got like a little emotional, there were some wacky characters, and then people who are so like starved for content are like, you know what, I'm just gonna kill them all. That'll get me content. When in reality, that's your choice. You don't have to. And I'm pretty sure there are people who say, you shouldn't. Yeah, no, there are a lot. It's can, there to punish you for can, being that way. It's why there's only two boss fights and they're very hard. Yeah, even the game itself, when you boot it up after a pacifist ending, just tells you to not play it. The goat says, comes up and says, go, go away. I can't believe Undertale would flip me off like that. <laughs> I hate Sans Undertale now. Uh -huh. Good question. Come get whatever these are. Yeah, no. You You're need... supposed to tweet them. Apparently. Don't. No. Do it. Don't do, do it. it. No, do it. I did it. You are. This free. is now your curse. You are free to tweet that. <laughs> no, what the phrase Sartre uses, you are condemned to be free to choose that. All right. Oh, that guy in the back's held his hand up. Yeah, you. Stand. Yes. No, no, no. No, no, no oh, no. Black, Not, black, black jacket. jacket. Do you have any thoughts about sort of this and maybe the genocide run and like if it's trying to make any points in that 
Are you writing like half of my next panel for me? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's read Camus. I love it. Uh, that's interesting because I think almost that's almost Sans Undertale in a way. He's obviously just very despondent outside of the genocide run. He kind of just doesn't do anything. In fact, he doesn't do anything until everyone except for him and like one other person's actually dead. And then he's like, oh, I guess I can't do nothing anymore. You know, he's kind of hit that despair because he keeps going through those timelines and seeing them and realizes, you know what, maybe none of this actually matters, so I'm just going to give up. And then genocide happens, as you pointed out. That's a good point. Do you want your free card? You want your free card. You've earned it. <laughs> uh, I'm White Jacket, yeah. did you still have a question? I always feel bad when people... Hell yeah. Where does nihilism or just Nietzsche and self come into play for, I guess, existentialism in the video? Uh, so Nietzsche has nihilism similar actually to Sartre. Um, he uses the phrase amor fati, uh, which is the love of fate. Uh, Nietzsche actually. That kind of fits in, because Nietzsche has the theory that a lot of people do, where the idea is that the universe will const has infinite possibilities, which means there's the possibility that this exact universe is going to happen again, and you're going to live your life again. So make it good, because when you live it infinitely, you don't want it to suck. Uh, but he's also more concerned with like, the idea of like, being in debt to things that you shouldn't be in debt to, such as the Christian moral idea. Uh, so it's more about stop looking towards the afterlife for your purpose and happiness and realize that you're living a really cool life where you're free to be happy right now. So you should go do that. Uh, you, even when you were asking your question, you used the phrase self-determination. It's the same concept as being condemned to be Determination. free. Determination? Ah. Ah. <laughs> Come get your card. People left because of that. Come get your card. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh, jeez. There's uh, so many I people. I think the guy in the front, I think, had a question earlier. Do you have a copy of this book? Wait. What are you reading? What? Why? <laughs> Get rid of it right now. Can you, like, explain? Uh, <laughs> uh, facticity. Um, yeah. Oh, my God. The facticity of freedom is the fact that freedom is not able not to be free. <laughs> Did everyone get that? <laughs> this is why you reread these books like three times. Um, you should read Immanuel Kant. He's similar. Don't. You're right, read Hegel. Don't do that either. <laughs> uh, so that maybe I, I kind of would be like a goof and just mention transcending transcendence, which is also a phrase that's mildly involved, I guess, if I wanted to be that guy. It was on a uh, But that's just like part of the idea that like... Slide, there you go. There's this idea that people think that there's moments where they like, I can't punch Terrence. I can punch Terrence. <laughs> I'm free to do that. My freedom is never able to not be free. But I consciously choose with my transcended transcendence to not punch Terrence. Because I understand consequences. He can kill me. <laughs> Notice he didn't say no. <laughs> he laughed. Here's your card. No, thank you. I can't believe you own this book. I'm, I was worried for a second. Was, Actually, oh, you could be the first one to try. There's a term in the glossary here. Oh, God. That's right, the glossary term. Oh, no. no. Go to the A's. Go to the A's. There we go. There we are. What is that second A word? How do you say that? Uh, Abschatungen? <laughs> I think he's right. I think you get, t like... No, just give him the computer. <laughs> I don't speak German, but I'm a singer. I've sung pieces in German. Ah, okay, okay. Don't tell me he was correct. <laughs> You're free to tell him he's wrong, even if he's right. All right. That one. Right there. 
Are you saying he's right? Yeah, I think so. Oh, Take your card. Uh, <laughs> I guess. I, yeah. You didn't have to tell him he was right. You could have lied. You're free to lie. It's true. Unlike what Immanuel Kant would say, you're free to lie. That's why you don't read well, Kant. I was also free to try to ignore what I heard. Shoot. Pronounce it. He's. If I had it. Somebody watched our panel. You know. All right. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, we have so many. Okay, um, up front. Yeah, Andrew, did you play Deltarune? That's when that game that's when that game comes out in the year 2030 and I cry. <laughs> yeah, no, I love Deltarune. I don't know what it was. Um, this is very personal and you no longer. I don't know an what it was that you liked about Deltarune. I liked it more than Undertale. It was probably because of Rousey. Uh, I should have done my cosplay for my panel last year, it was but it's too fine. Hot. The less people know about me, the better. Um, Except for that you've been talking about your panel from last year. I mean, honestly, Deltarune's all about your choices not mattering, so we, if that actually comes out, like we might have some content, maybe. We'll find out when it comes out, unless it's lying to us. Yeah, exactly. It's fun. I'm interested. I'm ready to see what happens when that finally comes out. I need it. I simply live with the pen. <laughs> All, right. All right. Oh, yeah. Why do you want one? <laughs> Look. Yeah, see? No, it's true. It's no. Don't, this is your don't curse put this now. evil on me. You're going to carry that weight. <laughs> All right, Team Rocket, you've been, you've been right. great. So, to tie it wow. in, since we're talking about last wow. panel. How do the modes of self compare to the self-image that you talked about last year with, like, the mirror? Oh. This is such a different term that, like, this welcome is... to philosophy. <laughs> you're we using now... the same word? Those are, like, two separate books. You're like, to ask, you're, like, saying, like, oh, so Harry Potter is just the same as, like, Infinite Jest, right? They're both books, right? And I'm like, they're both books. One of them is pretentious. The other is infinite jest. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is very much a car engine to oranges kind oh of thing. God. Yeah, it's like one of the issues with... Actually, uh, there's a cool guy, uh, Bertrand Russell, who writes about this in his Problems of Philosophy, which is also an excellent way to get into philosophy, because uh, he just kind of talks about how it's kind of like gone the way where every person can't read philosophy anymore. When it originally it started as that, it was just Socrates kind of going around going like, hey, do you know what justice is? <laughs> Turns out you don't. <laughs> Whoops. And now we have these people who are like, ah, yes, the bone body with freedom that's not able to not be not free. <laughs> not able to not. I want to do that after getting off of work after eight hours is read that. <laughs> I or I could play Undertale. I think you missed a in there. No, don't. Stop. <laughs> You're going to read Hegel for next year's panel now. <sighs> Good question, though. All right. Uh, the guy in the back has had his hand up like Aww. through every question. Oh. Oh, yeah. Team Rock, get your card. How Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like so much like not dark, but it's like it tricks you into thinking that they're real people. And they cease to be the second you realize that you're just reading a document. You're kind of just like, oh, this character just only exists to be viewed by the other. There's no in itself or for itself that's actually there. Which is why we started to bring up video games, because those characters are the same way. Except for, I guess, one, maybe two. Because uh, one of them judges us, mm -hmm. which was the last panel, which I think was not very clear, but I tried. Sarch was hard. Sarch, yeah. uh, so I wouldn't say that it makes them less dark. It's just that Sarch was like, really interested in the way that like, characters in books affect us, despite not having many of the things that define existence and purpose. Does that answer your question at all? Okay, yeah, that's philosophy. 
Kinda, I guess. Kinda. And then you go write a 20-page paper about why I'm wrong. It's great. <laughs> Do you want your card? You want your it card. It doesn't matter if you want it or not. You are getting get this card. <laughs> Team Rocket, come up here and get your card, too. It's better if you don't know, honestly. <laughs> Thank oh. you. Thank you. Oh, oh, that's your water bottle. <laughs> Do you want a card? <laughs> no, don't. No, don't give the... Oh, yeah, we'll trade. He's already got one. Awesome. Let's collect them all. <laughs> all right. Oh, man, more questions. All right, oh you. God. Yes, you. Yes. And Pointing we'll... at yourself. Wait. No. no. Front, and then we'll do the guy all the way in the back, because I feel bad for the people in the back, and then we'll do the guy behind you. So that's one, two, three. The people got in the back. it? All right. You. Sark has the concept of you are not free to not be free, I'm getting my knots right. Yes. Um, so I'm curious if you have any input on other philosophies or him with the hypothetical of someone, like an entity who is forced to not be free, the example being a character like uh, someone in Bioshock or other games that are coming to mind, but you are forced to not be free. You don't have true freedom. Does he play with that? Like, we are not free to not be free, but the hypothetical of a person or anything doesn't have that Isn't that what Oh, that's yeah. Bandersnatch. Bandersnatch. The character of Bandersnatch is not free to be Gross. Do you want to take it? Or I think I can take it. I mean, you I think you me get on. it. I think you said it in our panel, so I'll let oh, you answer oh, this one at yo. one point. Okay. You said the answer. Oh, God, I hate that. It's on the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so... The, 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 at the very beginning of it, it's the distinction, the distinction between some, an in itself and a for itself is that freedom. If something lacks that freedom, it is an in itself. Uh, it's a video game character. They are, they, they are a document. They are an image on a screen. They are code floating out somewhere in someone's GitHub. Um, yeah, like we, we had the quote, and I think it like goes back to that is like they exist solely as a being for others. There's no existence or consciousness or transcendence, maybe some facticity, I guess. Um, but in fact, I think the more interesting bit that Sartre probably couldn't have predicted because video games weren't a thing is like, are you acting in bad faith if you're playing a game that gives you like no options? Like when I go through my hallway simulator, am I like experiencing existential like dread somehow so there are like so we can talk about you talked about bioshock which is relevant to this and there are two other games that deal with this spec ops the line oh, and shit. shadow of the colossus both of them deal with that so those the, are good games yeah they are t yeah. right well spec ops the line is an interesting game but its gameplay is meh <laughs> but off topic so in bioshock you are operating under false pretenses but you still have agency and freedom. Uh, when you're playing through it, there's no point where you have to go, at, you, at no point do you have to follow the voice that you're getting in, on over the radio. You can say, oh, this guy's lying to me, and then walk in the opposite direction. You'll run out of game really fast if you do that, <laughs> but you can do that. You can just turn around, walk away, and turn off the game. Um, uh, Spec Ops, we'll do other games we're talking about, Shadow of the Colossus and Spec Ops line. Shadow of the Colossus, never tells you why you're doing what you're doing. You're just literally found following a bouncing objective marker around the map. Um, and even by the end of the game, you aren't really sure what you were doing or why you were doing it. Um, and Spec Ops The Line has a famous scene where you're launching white phosphorus uh, at what you are told or think, think, are enemy combatants, but eventually turn out to be civilians. But in all of these cases... Spoiler alert. Okay. That game is like 10 years old now. I was going to say, though. for a 10-year-old game. Um, but in, in, the case, in all of these cases, the thing you have to remember is that at the end of the day, it's a document. It's a video game. You can get rid of You can turn it off and throw it away and never touch it again. And you always have the freedom to do that even if you can't do it within the context of the game, because you have greater context than just the game. See, this is why I like Adorno a bit better, because he talks about these concepts and experiences of like, like he loves music, and he loves the idea that like doing something like that in the musical equivalent, like say you're listening to Schoenberg, and it's atonal, and it's uncomfortable, it's not great, and he loves that. Because now the music's not for ignoring, it's for embracing the awkwardness of what it's like to be around a bunch of people. You can't reset the Adorno clock. 
He's a cool guy. <laughs> he hates things like me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, who is number two after that's good? An that was very. Oh yeah. Get your come up here and get your card. Get your card. Get your card. No, no, no. Do not let hubris consume you. <laughs> all right, and then I think I said the guy all the way in the back. That's you, yes, you. Uh, so this See, that's the thing I think is interesting, is I think having agency is a big deal. Uh, I actually prefer games that have a lot of that. It's why, hey, hot take. I know, really controversial. I love New Vegas. Whoa, that's crazy. Who likes New Vegas? Nobody, right? Can you imagine liking New Vegas? Gross. Because you can just beat the final boss with a speech check, and I always do it. <laughs> There's nothing. It's why I like stealth games. It's because you can go through most stealth games and not kill anybody. It's awesome. I love games like that. I think it's great, right? But that doesn't actually affect your character. Because, like, that's other people's perception. Depends on the game. Uh, I feel like agency in a big way is like kind of the thing that's gonna move video games in a weird, strange way, honestly. Um, well, because like out of all, I don't, man, I wish I had my secondary panel this year. I was gonna talk video games as a fine art and that was gonna be way more serious than this. Oof. But like, I feel like the agency and the control aspect of video games is what makes them unique compared to other mediums. Like, even the interactive choose your own adventures, like Bandersnatch or David Cage games, um, where it's just like you're watching a movie games. and you press a button instead. Uh, but I feel like, especially for Sartre, being able to choose completely and absolutely what you do would mean that the video game's not bad for you. I kind of wonder if he'd just hate video games because they're forcing you to act in bad faith the whole time. Well, it also would depend on the video game. Because you have video games, like you're talking about video games where they have set storylines, but more and more you're starting to see more, what was it called? Like procedurally designed video games. So a good example would be Shadow of Mordor. There's very, there's like three plot points in all of Shadow of Mordor. Um, but you spend all of your time dynamically creating these narratives around these orc generals that you're propping up or trying to assassinate. Yeah, them. you kind of believe they're characters, but they're not. Um, this is a, a sort of a follow-up question to his. Uh, is there a distinction? How is there a distinction, or how would you describe the distinction between character as perceived as the, by the other and character as perceived for yourself? So. Wow, you're really giving me the quiz now. Um, I mean, I feel like that second one like almost doesn't exist because those characters already exist as solely for the others. I you're the other. Mm. That, so when you say it exists for you, you're basically saying like, oh, you're the other. So yeah, of course it exists for me. So They're the same thing. So this is that alienation we were talking about on that slide earlier. <sighs> yes, alienation. Where when you begin to Let's see yourself. that term. <laughs> When you perceive yourself as a character, you're no longer perceiving yourself. Yeah, you're acting as a character and what your character would do, such as the perfect waiter or Sans Undertale. Make sure he gets a card. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, come get your card, coward. Get your... <laughs> He's on his phone. He's trying to ignore us. You in the back. You forgot your We know your who prize. you are. You cannot escape me. <laughs> Your bone body is there forever. <laughs> yes, drag him forward to us. That's fine. All right. You, you're next. Howdy. Howdy. Hi. Uh, you can't say that in a panel like this. Oh, I know. Uh, Howdy. Oh, yes. I was wondering, at some level, do you believe Sam's looking for true freedom? In essence, um, if you take what he wanted was a place where he could make whatever choice he makes and do whatever he wants, but if you also believe in multi, what is it, multiversal theory, then it doesn't really matter. So the choice he makes creates another branch of an endless tree that does nothing. So we're all kind of stuck in this like birthday of innumerable rules, which we can we can comprehend as we currently are. And so personally, do you think we're kind of stuck in that birdcage acknowledging those rules and not ever actually making any freedom choices just the illusion of choice? Or do you think there's true freedom absolutely and just want to go out there and we can't slip through the lake at some point, but what does that all mean? Are we talking about Undertale or are we talking about real life? I need yeah, to answer you're that. Yeah, describing my job right now and I don't <laughs> like it. 
Anyway, kick-ass question, as we say. Also, come get your card just already. Nice question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can just go anywhere with this, you know. I drink AR friends and drink Good. Someone's not a coward. Person in the back whose name I know and will not say out loud. I see you, you see me. The, the gaze of the other is in full effect right now. You can feel friend. the weight of every pair of eyes in this room on you. Uh, <laughs> I think you touch on something. I think that video games haven't quite got down yet, actually, and that is like true freedom. Uh, I think a lot of people, like when they propped up Skyrim, is, you know, you see that mountain? You can go to that mountain and do nothing. Uh, if we're going to game theory it up, uh, it's not just a theorizing. There we go. Copyright. No, trademark. I went to the panel on this. <sighs> he saw the lawyers. He's been tainted ever since. Uh, someone like, has that picture in Sans' room where there's like the people that they think are from Deltarune, and he says, don't forget, which is in the song from Deltarune. And so apparently they're like, people are thinking there's this tragic backstory where Sans is now lost in the timeline of Undertale, and he's desperately trying to go back to his true friends from Deltarune. Well, I guess we can't really say anything until the game comes out. I have my own idea of what I want Deltarune to be, which I might save for later, if you're actually curious. I'm not. <laughs> How many days has it been since... Uh... Uh, it's been like 454 since Deltarune came out. Okay, just wanted to check. There's a guy who posts every day. He keeps count. That's how I know I can always ask you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think the idea of like true freedom in games honestly just hasn't been hit yet. Uh, if anything, at right now it's still the illusion of choice. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot to say unless we like really get into it. I mean, we could elaborate. Like, I love games like the Stanley Parable because they make fun of that a ton, yes. and it's entertaining too. Like, I think a lot of fine art and things like that just try to be miserable, which has its place in time. I love movies that make me feel miserable. Like, they're great, but I feel like that also undermines the fact that funny things can also be good. Like that movie Brazil we watched. Brazil's awesome. I love. It's Brazil. a fun time. You feel miserable by the end of it. It was awful. I laughed I and then it. I cried. <laughs> I just sat in a chair and stared at the ceiling for six hours. It was great. Yeah, I actually the first time I watched that movie, I stared out a window while it was raining and just kind of like. <laughs> <fall down. laughs> and then I think I went to like someone's graduation ceremony in an hour. It was a weird time. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I don't know. True freedom is hard. Sarch is trying to help us out with that because I don't think he gets it yet either. Because then you have to ask. So what? I'm not. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm yeah, not yeah, do yeah. I'm no, not Terrence, do, it. do you want to just like take up three hours? <laughs> ask me a question. <laughs> All right. All right. New question. Oh. <laughs> yes. Not my boyfriend. Oh, um, so you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but. Uh, do you think it's even possible to have a video game that gives you true freedom? Is does playing a video game in itself make you have bad faith by working towards an objective? This is the question I was not going to ask him. So <laughs> it's an interesting thing you bring up. Because that depends on how you express freedom in video games. Because just like life, in video games there are rules and things you need to abide by. So it depends how you define the freedom as you're in the rules, but you can do whatever you want, or there are no rules, which makes you free. Uh, so, oh, what's a good stealth game that I played recently? I don't know. I always like talking about Dishonored, because you just run through that game and not touch people. It's awesome, and then you get a nice ending. That's freedom. That's cool. Or you can kill everyone and make me feel bad, because I, like, I don't know, I'm weird. <laughs> I feel bad when I play stealth games and kill people. <laughs> Actually, that's why I like MGS5. I played through that whole game and didn't kill people except for that one mission where you have to kill people, and that made that mission spoiler alert extra hard. Hey, I didn't say how or why. Maybe it's when you see the kids in the prison cell. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> that game gets dark. Uh, Just remember that war is bad. That's the message. Yes, that is the message. Uh, so I don't know. I think that's something we all need to figure out for ourselves in a way, which. Reading philosophy can help us. Because there's no real answers, but we can figure them out. I know that we've spent this entire panel telling you to, under no circumstances, read this book. But having read most of this book, is pretty good read. 
if you really just want like an abridged version, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is an awesome resource. It's basically like Wikipedia, but only people with PhDs can edit it, and they have like intense bibliographies and edit like resources. Can, it's great. You can see PhDs engaged in edit wars. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, it is probably faster because it'll probably only take you about a month to get through all the content you need to to understand Sartre. I spent a year reading this book. I am not done this book. I don't think I'm done this book, and I've read it twice now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. Yeah. You've been waiting. Uh, so, all right, so Everyone's with the uh, character, right? So how can we predict the character of the other when we perceive their bone body and not their being in itself or for itself? So why is character not self, uh, why is character not only self-perceivable? So here's the thing, Sartre talks about self-perception, you can never do that. The only way you do self-perception is by pretending to be the other and thinking about the, how the other perceives you. But wait, then you can't see character at all. No. It's, it's no, you can't see your own character. You know your character, but you can't see it. When you see the character of other people, it's the bone body. So you yep. perceiving, so the character is just, it exists in theory, mm -hmm. but it's like you just have to trust that it's there. Yes, actually yep. that is exactly what he says. There is a, <laughs> yeah! Get your card, sir. Uh, I mean, I don't want to go on a tangent, but David Hume kind of talks similarly. I'd welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome to our hell. I don't, uh, do, dude, I don't know. They're what? here. Wait, 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 I want no, to no, get no, rid no, of no, them. No, 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 no. I back this up. You want to know where this is happening? <laughs> Maybe if you tweet the hashtag, you'll get a DM. Uh, but David Hume kind of talks about something similarly, because out of all the philosophers of the time, like Descartes, he's the one who's just like, hey, let's talk about the self. You ever notice that if you try it, like Sartre says, to like perceive yourself, to see who yourself is, you're just like someone else perceiving someone else. And then you have to perceive that fact, you need someone else to be perceiving that. And suddenly it goes on infinitely. So let's just stop talking about the self. Yeah, that's actually what he says. It's two pages. It's awesome. Yeah, like, like and we were talking earlier. That's that alienation of self. You can't perceive yourself unless you alienate yourself from yourself. But then you're not you. And, and it sucks, like you say, like because you know who you are. You feel who you are. Right? No one else is able to see that. They Do just you? like they see your sense organs. They don't see your senses. They don't know what you're seeing. I don't know how much of an idiot I look like up here. I can just assume. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You with the mask. Yeah, so uh, I'm not recommending ever doing this, but uh, that's the soul panel. Situation panel. in which I've done some things and I lost my sense of self for a while, and um, I don't know. It, I think this relates somehow where I had to redefine who I was. How is that? How is that? How am I perceiving myself at that point? I think you have to ask yourself that. <laughs> Because that's what Sartre says, is you build these ideas of self, and you think you know what you're about, and then suddenly that one aspect, which you're like, I'm about this, is suddenly gone. And you're like, wait, what am I actually about? I think like the worst I've ever seen it is someone I knew like told me about their friend. So this is like, I'm removed from this situation, thank goodness, because like, they loved flying planes, and they were very smart. And then they had a medical thing happen in which they couldn't fly planes, and they were mentally handicapped in a way. And suddenly that person was like, oh wait, who am I? And it's like, damn, that's horrifying. This is why Sartre uses the language of condemned to be free, because it doesn't make it's you not feel that dark it is well, it, 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 no no it's the, not no no yes you're using it no. wrong condemning to be free is a freeing statement that is uplifting <laughs> it can be no it is because once you discover that thing that you thought was yourself isn't yourself you're free you can be whatever you want at that point that thing that was holding you back and keeping you in your little bird cage like they said doesn't exist anymore you're always transcending Potentialities. <laughs> I think I just did with my words. <laughs> it's oh, safer that how are way. Are you getting questions still? 
<laughs> All right, you. Yes, glasses. Um, on a scale from 1 to 100, how much do you actually believe in free will? Okay, so in philosophy, free will kind of doesn't matter, unless you're an ethics person, which we won't get into. Because here's the thing that most people have agreed upon, whether free, free will is real or not, you won't ever be able to tell, so it doesn't matter. The only time it matters is when certain ethics people go, okay, well, who do we hold accountable if there's no free will? What it's is one of those accountability? Problems. Wait, what would accountability be if you don't have free will? Yeah, it kind of ends there, and people go, oh, well, then it doesn't matter then. And this isn't fun, and we can't do philosophy with that. This reminds me a lot of the Reef of Solipsism. Sure, please do. Have, uh, same question, but on a scale from everything is determined to nothingness. Chaos or order? What? Yeah. I mean, What's the... you're free to make anything you want. So about 100? We'll say 100, but everyone is constantly choosing not to be 100. <laughs> Cowards. <laughs> Uh, I think purple hair? Yeah, yeah you. Uh, so some video games you end up... Some video games you have complete like choice on where you want to go. Other ones you're controlling a character that is preordained in its personality. So in some extent, aren't you then just controlling a bone body that you are... I like this question. <laughs> They're using my philosophical terms. It gives me great strength. <laughs> Neologisms are hard to create when you don't publish enough papers, but we've done it. Someone else used the bone body. It's officially a word I've now. Made it. It's That's gonna it. be in the next edition of the Webster Dictionary. I'm gonna have my own Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry now. <laughs> the bone body. And then I'm going to delete it. Because <laughs> it does not deserve to be on there. Uh, <laughs> You have to get a PhD. That's true. You have no, to get a I don't PhD want to. to. It. I've already rejected that too. <laughs> I'm glad I did. Nobody's happy there. Uh, but that is an excellent point because I think that brings up the fact that like I don't know if Sartre would like video games because of how much like you're required to act as somebody else rather than yourself. So like with his philosophy, I almost wonder if he'd hate video games. Sorry. He doesn't hate books though. But books don't pretend. That you they do. Agency. They give you, what does he say? He says, like, bare... Bare facts. Yeah, something like bare givens that make you assume they're real people with conscious decisions within itself, for itself, transcendence, facticity. They're... Exactly. It's just a document. There's no actual bone body. Um, so maybe he'd consider them similar, only you get to interact with them. And I think that's the part that he might hate, is the fact that you yourself have to play that character. Or he'd love it because it'd make his point that even though, like, yeah, you're pressing buttons, but you're still acting as a character. Can we just find book? his bone body and ask that? Yeah, let's go. For... All right, guys, we're going on a oh, field no, trip. No, no, <laughs> He's probably in France. Oh, yes. No, you have your book. Shoot. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> this book is open. I have a thing with your one Opposite of, like, the games. Uh, would an AI that responds to the player input to try to learn from them and react to specific player behaviors count for itself? So, I love the topic of AI, because AI sucks. I hate the topic of AI, because right I now, have a degree in computer yeah. science. As of right now, there's no such thing as that. Most AI are just algorithms that are put into an environment in which the algorithm will succeed. There is no thought, there is no consciousness, and there is no reflective nature of self. There's temporality, reflection, and being for others, though. Is there? There's being for, for the AI? When be, I play chess? Be, as we covered earlier. Is that AI? It depends who you ask. <laughs> the second it became a thing, everyone's like, wait, this isn't AI. No, it's not AI. We do not, ha we do not have AI currently. Do not listen to anyone who tells you otherwise. I can confirm this is actually my field. <laughs> I don't know why he went from that field to this one. I was bored. <laughs> I regret that. Oh my god, he's using tension to gloss right It wouldn't count as a for itself by any traditional definition, but it's interesting that Stasi's just say there are these three criteria, uh, which 
Well, the program might be for itself. Like the inkwell, it exists in its oh. for a purpose, um, I guess. And if you take the lines of code and kind of destroy them, those lines of codes oh. do trace. It's twelve thirty. It is twelve thirty. I don't know if there's a panel after this one. There is. There is. Shoot. Ah. Oh, I was having fun. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm yes. surprised anyone showed up at eleven thirty. Uh,